falling of trust in riches. Hear this, all you peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to the proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the heart. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of my persecutors surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly no ransom avails for one's life. There is no price one can give to God for it. For the ransom of life is costly and can never suffice. That one should live on forever and never see the grave. When we look at the wise, they die. Fool and gold perish together and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling places to all generations though they name lands of their own. Mortals cannot abide in their palm. They are like the animals that perish. And our epistle lesson is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. New life in Christ. So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ is, your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Our gospel lesson is Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. The parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, What should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night, your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves that are not rich for God. Herein 
is the Scripture, and God bless the reading and hearing of His Holy Word. A prosperous young investment banker was driving a new BMW sedan on a mountain road during a snowstorm. As he veered around a sharp turn, he lost control and began sliding off the road toward a deep precipice. At the last moment, he unbuckled his seatbelt, flung open his door, and leaped from the car, which then tumbled down the ravine and burst into a ball of flames. Though he escaped with his life, the man suffered a ghastly injury. Somehow his arm had been caught near the end of the door as he jumped and had been torn off at the shoulder. The truck driver saw the accident in his rearview mirror. He pulled his rig to a halt and ran to see if he could help. He found the banker standing at the roadside, looking down at the BMW burning in the ravine below. My BMW, my new BMW, the banker moaned, oblivious to his injury. The trucker pointed to the banker's shoulder and said, You've got bigger problems than that car. We've got to find your arm. Maybe the surgeons can sew it back on. The banker looked where his arm had been, paused a moment, grumbled, Oh no, my Rolex, my new Rolex. I believe the man was a bit preoccupied with his possessions. They meant more to him than even his physical health. The parable of the rich fool is about preoccupation with possessions. It's about a rich man who has such a bump of crop that he doesn't even have enough storage buildings to keep it all. So he decides to tear down the barns and build bigger ones. Then, because he'll have plenty of grain and other good things, much more than he can ever use, he'll just take life easy. <laughs> Sit back and relax, nothing to worry about. But when God speaks to this man, he is not happy with the man's attitude. God even calls a man a fool. In God's eyes, this man's possessions meant absolutely nothing. Unfortunately for the man, his possessions meant more to him than even God. Today's gospel passage seems particularly appropriate for this time of year. It's summertime and much of the Piedmont landscape is dotted with fields of corn and even still some tobacco. Many folks have backyard gardens. And if the crop is good, then most folks end up with much more than they can use for themselves. And then the question becomes, the things you are prepared, whose will they be? The rich man had a great crop. And great crop, such, such a bumper crop, they didn't even have enough storage space. It's got so much overflowing. So the man is in a quandary. And we're able to listen in as the man thinks to himself. Jesus knew the man's heart. Remember that we cannot keep anything hidden from God. So the man asks himself, well, what shall I do? The value of his heart is as far exceeding his expectations, and he has no way to score his problem. That seems to be a real problem for him. But where the problem is not posed by the size of his harvest, but by his insistence on gathering and storing it for his own use. He plans to hoard it, keep it all for himself. The thought never even enters his mind to share with those in need. No, he's going to keep it all for himself. And once he decides to build bigger barns to store the crops, notice his self-centeredness in the frequent use of the possessive pronoun my cross, my bonds, my grain, my goods, and finally, my soul. He's very confident about his future, and he says to himself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. They might be easy to eat, drink, and be merry. The greatest good he can imagine is a life of maximizing his own pleasure. Leisure, recreation, and freedom from the demands of work. He's got it made. Or so he thinks. 
This man had shut everyone else out from his life and his thoughts, even God. There's no room for anyone else, just himself and his possessions. But just as a man thinks his everything planned out, God speaks to him. Matthew now surprised the man who must have been. Obviously, the man had forgotten that God could hear his thoughts. God then proceeds to tell the man what his future would actually be. It's quite different from what the man had planned out. God says, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This night sharply contradicts the rich man's presumption of many years. In reality, the rich man is not secure as he thought, for no human being, even a rich one, is a new to death. We are all born to die, and one day our life will begin. This man's false security in his possessions is unmasked. It turns out the man is very foolish. In this parable told by Jesus, the rich man makes many mistakes. And this parable speaks so clearly to 21st century American culture as if this parable was written today. And even those of us who are Christians are sometimes guilty of taking the attitude of the rich fool. First of all, the man never gave credit to God for what he had. He never realized that it was God who had blessed him with the bountiful harvest. In this parable, God does not even appear to be in the picture at all. The man only speaks of himself. There seems to be no relationship with God or with anyone else in that. This man was so preoccupied with his wealth and possessions, he forgot about God. And whenever things are going well, we tend to forget about God. And so this is a very important lesson in stewardship. We can never forget that all that we have is given to us from God. He is the one who provides all the blessings. So God must get all the credit. And we're all blessed in many different ways. Yes, some folks happen to be blessed with wealth and possessions. But other people might not have as much stuff, but they're blessed with family and friends. But the temptation these days is for material blessings to get in the way of our relationship with God. We're so bombarded with materialistic messages in our culture. There are so many things that we have to have or we think we have to have. Things or possessions are not bad in and of themselves, but they become a problem when they are the focal point of our existence rather than God. Now it's one thing to be rich with possessions, but we are supposed to be rich toward God. A relationship with God must be the most important part of our lives. It must be at the center and not all the things that we have. They should be secondary, really bottom of, of the list. But number one must be our relationship with God. Because our possessions, they're not going to get us into heaven. When we die, it doesn't matter how much money or possessions you have. You think that it does, but it doesn't. You see, that quickly passes away and you certainly cannot take anything with you. We're all equal. Therefore, we must have our treasures stored up in heaven. The rich man was secure in his self-sufficiency, but it turned out to be a false sense of security. Because of his wealth, he didn't think he needed anyone else. He needed neither the love of family nor faithful friends. He does not feel the need of a community of support nor the security of God's love. He thought all that he needed was his possessions. But when our life ends and our soul is required of God, we need him rather than our possessions. Unless we have depended upon God all along and have accepted Christ as our Savior, then our treasure will not be stored up in heaven. Only Jesus Christ can get us in heaven. Whatever material possessions we own will get us absolutely no. The 
rich man was greedy. How oh, old was he greedy? He never gave thought to what he could do to help others in need. He only cared about his own welfare. If God does bless us with money or a good crop of vegetables, well, then there's a reason for it. We're to share with others and to help those who are in need. Instead of thinking of ways to keep all this grain, the rich man should have given his excess away. And that would solve his problem, wouldn't it? It's a pretty easy fix to his, to his problem. No, he didn't think about that. I mean, he would have had more than enough himself anyway. He certainly wasn't going to go hungry. So we cannot be selfish as the rich man was. Jesus Christ was not selfish. He didn't have to die. Jesus didn't have to die for us. But he gave generously, in fact, his very life. We are beneficiaries of God's generosity. So we must do the same in whatever ways we can. The rich man was hedonistic. Remember, he said he would eat, drink, and be merry. His daydream is to spend his future indulging his own whims and desires. He was going to do whatever he wanted to do. We tend to think this way sometimes ourselves. His vision of the future sounds uncomfortably like the one that most of us have for our retirement years. We get too comfortable with all that we have and we rest on our laurels. We forget that this life will have an end. We forget that we must live not for ourselves, but for God. It's not supposed to be about what we want to do, but about what God wants us to do. Being a Christian and being obedient to God's will is not about eating, drinking, or being merry. It's about serving God and others, putting Him and others before ourselves. Now, this passage is a hard one for us to read. Especially when we are daily tempted to follow the ways of the world, which is the example of the rich fool. That's the way the world lives. Society teaches us to be like the rich fool, Lord, and keep it all for yourselves. But unless we wish to be called unprepared as a rich man, then we must take a close look at ourselves and how we handle our possessions. Are we rich for God? Or is our treasure stored up in earthly possessions? J. Burton McGee has some very pointed thoughts to say about the parable of the rich fool. He says, Our Lord called the man this parable a fool. Now, all outward appearances indicate that he was a good man. He was a law abiding citizen. He was above suspicion. He was living a good life in suburbia and living in the best residential area of the city. He was not a wicked man or a member of the mafia. He was not crooked in politics. He was not engaged in shady business. This man seems to be all right. And our Lord called him a fool. Why? This man gave all his thought to himself. And he was very covetous. I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small. Three guests in all. Just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank up the tea. It was also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. This is the way many people live. It's probably the way most people live these days. The parable of the rich fool is one of the most pungent paragraphs in the Word of God. The philosophy of the world is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Our Lord has said that's the problem. That's what makes a man a fool. If you live as though this life is all there is, and you live just for self, and as though there's nothing beyond death, you are a fool. The parable of the rich fool is a lesson of stewardship. It's about what we do with what God has entrusted to us. Are we sharing and giving generously to God? And others, or are we keeping it all for ourselves? Are we hoarding it? Are we just building up bigger and bigger bars and storing it, not doing anything with it, just keeping it for ourselves? That's not what God wants us to do. Is our faith in Jesus Christ the center of our lives, or are we too proud 
part of our possessions. So our possessions can't get us into heaven. Only Jesus Christ can. Are we storing our treasures to things of this earth which will pass away? Or are we storing our treasures in heaven which is for eternity? What will God say to us when our life is demanding from us? Will we be ready to go with Him and leave our possessions behind because we have been rich for God? Or will He call us a fool because we have been selfish and stored up things only for ourselves? Where your heart is, there will be your treasure also. Let us pray. Lord, the parable of the rich fool is one of the best parables in all of Scripture. It is such an important lesson for us. All too often we are selfish and we want to keep all that we have close to us. We're afraid to share it. We're afraid to give to you what we're supposed to give. We give so little to you, Lord. We're supposed to give of our time, our talent, our treasure. And yet we want to keep it all for ourselves like the rich fool. When we have that excess, no, we don't think about sharing it and giving it away. No, we we'll report it and store it up and build bigger barns for ourselves as well. We know that didn't turn out too well for that rich man, did it? Well, we don't want to be called a fool. We don't want to be storing our treasure only on earthly things. Lord, we want to be storing our treasure in heaven. So, Lord, work in our hearts. Open us up to be generous, to be the stewards you called us to be, that what we have been entrusted with you call us to share and to give. A tenth of time. Ten percent of our income is supposed to go to you, O Lord. And yet, people give so little, so little. And when we give you so little, we're only robbing ourselves of further blessings. And we're selfish with our time and our talents. We don't want to do things in the church. We don't want to volunteer. And it can't be that way, Lord. So help us to see what you want us to see. Work in our hearts. Open people up, Lord, to give more of themselves to you and to our church. Help us to be more generous, Lord. Help us to store our treasure, not in earthly things, but in heaven. Because heaven is for eternity. These possessions will pass away and they'll be nothing. Lord, we need you and you only. So Lord, all this we pray in your name. Amen. As saints of old, their first fruits draw the vineyard flock and field. To God, the giver of all good, the source of bounties yield. So we today, our first fruits bring the wealth of this good land, a farm, a market, shop and home, a mind and heart and hand. Let us stand as we sing our hymn of commitment number 650. 